And here with us today, we have Omar uh, Tene. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, do you want to provide just a really brief, uh, in a nutshell, about your background? I know many folks in the privacy community know about you, but would love to have you share um, a bit about yourself. Sure. Thank you, Divya. It's a pleasure being here. And thanks uh, to the SIIA for um, inviting me. Um, I'm currently a partner at Goodwin based in Boston, and I work on data privacy and cybersecurity. I'm also a senior fellow at the Future Privacy Forum. Awesome. We're excited to dig in. There's been a lot of new developments just starting off the new year. Uh, and I think 2023 uh, is going to be really packed with lots, uh, you know, chock full of uh, both global and federal privacy developments as well as uh, on the state front for sure. Um, so first question, I think we're going to start off with a few questions on federal privacy and then dig into kind of the global implications um, and what's happening uh, internationally. So our first question for you is, um, you know, the year's gotten off to a rocky start uh, with the House Speaker election uh, taking almost 15 votes to finally confirm uh, Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Um, it could be foreshadowing, I would say, for the polarizing forces within Congress and also some of the potential challenges with some of these battle battleground issues like tech accountability and privacy. Um, would love your take, Omar, on uh, you know how you see these divisions across and within the parties, and what this could mean for privacy legislation in the 118th Congress. You know, do you see ADPPA as a starting point? Do you see a, a different draft? Um, just uh, high level uh, insights there would be great. Yeah, thanks. Um, so you know, I think um, at a high level, privacy, specifically in tech tech regulation more generally haven't been partisan issues. So there has been a lot of bipartisan convergence around them. Uh, the ADPPA was a three corners bill, so it did have bipartisan and bicameral cameral support. Uh, some of the kids' privacy bills uh, that we've seen, COSA, COPPA 2.0, have been bipartisan also. And of course, um, everyone saw President Biden's recent op-ed on privacy and technology regulation. Now, you know, of course, there has been a lot of um, uh, dysfunction, some would say, and partisan strife and even intra-partisan strife uh, in Washington, as you described. Um, and, you know, there's just a general sense of inability to move things um, in actually the past couple of Congresses, unfortunately, uh, on the day we are recording this uh, today, the debt ceiling standoff is kind of coming to a head. Um, but I think if things do advance, and of course, you know, everybody hopes that uh, Congress uh, will be functional and able to advance some initiatives, uh, this could be a win because the, there is bipartisan support. In terms of the starting point, um, I do think that ADPPA was a sound compromise. Uh, so I think it should be the um, starting point, at least. Uh, in terms of the House, uh, uh, the same leadership uh, uh, has remained, in, specifically in the Energy and Commerce Committee, with uh, Kathy McMorris-Rogers, of course, now she's the chair, and uh, Pallone is the ranking member, but the two of them were, you know, yeah. highly committed to the ADPPA and able to pass it with a resounding um, majority in their committee at past 53 to 2. Um, Kevin McCarthy is now the speaker. And of course, uh, he too is from California, uh, like yeah. Speaker Pelosi. And that was really the basis for her opposition to ADPPA because of the preemption issue. Um, but I think that McCarthy might, um, you know, have a different view. First of all, he's on the record uh, supporting federal privacy legislation with preemption. And of course, he caters to a different uh, constituency in California. So um, I think if anything, there will be movement towards um, more support uh, for this bill. On the Senate side, um, you know, Senator Cantwell, who continues to chair 
the Commerce Committee has been opposed. She was the one corner missing from the four corners on the last bill. Um, she now has a new uh, partner. It's no longer Roger Wicker's ranking uh, member. It's going to be Ted Cruz. Um, and, you know, we might see a, a competing draft come yeah. uh, from the Senate side. Maria Cantwell had one in the last yeah. uh, Congress uh, called COPRA, but by and large, it was pretty similar to uh, ADPPA. There were some differences, uh, but I think they weren't um, that significant. So I do think that ADPPA will continue to be the center of gravity for federal or privacy law. That's great. And I think also a little nuance here, Senator Cruz, uh, many people don't know this, was a uh, former director for the, I think for the privacy division at the FTC. So he does have a background focused on these issues. I feel like recently we've been hearing that, you know, he may be, he may not be on board or that's not part of his agenda. But uh, I think if you look back, think back to, um, you know, where, what all he's accomplished, there, there could be some additional support there as well. So um, we'll have to really kind of wait and see. It's going to be a wait and see, but um, you've raised a lot of good points about the different drafts. And also last year, I think we had heard close to the vest, Senator Cantwell did have a draft, didn't actually come out, I don't believe, uh, formally, but um, we're hoping to see some additional movement from both sides, the Senate and the House. Um, and you also clarified the question about preemption. I was going to ask you know, a little bit about some of the sticking points around preemption, especially now that we still have somebody in a leadership, you know, obviously the speaker still is from California. And so uh, that conti may continue to, to remain a bit of an obstacle, but I think you clarified that we might see some additional momentum um, just because you know he might be able to rein in some of the other folks that uh, previously stood uh, opposed to ADPPA due to preemption. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Divya. I I do think on this that the uh, kind of grand bargain remains uh, private right of action plus preemption, or no private right of action and no preemption. Of, yeah. of course, the former is the ADPPA version, and the latter is the current uh, default. I think the Democratic leadership, at least in terms of uh, um, former Speaker Pelosi and uh, Senator Cantwell, has chosen the latter latter path. So they, you know, uh, at the end of the day, they preferred the current default, no legislation, to this draft, which had a private right of action plus uh, uh, preemption. I think part of the reason is that some voices on the Democrat side thought the private right of action isn't strong enough. Okay. Um, I think trial lawyers were concerned about the um, arbitration you know, option and thought that the anti-arbitration clause that uh, uh, does appear in the ADPPA, but a very limited one, isn't um, sufficient to kind of uh, enable a robust private right of action. Uh, personally, I think um, having a private right of action is a huge, huge game changer in this space. We've seen, um, you know, BIPA, which is such a narrow sliver of a privacy law in one state, you know, just focusing on uh, a very specific type of information has had resounding impact uh, in the United States and is probably the most feared privacy law um, on this side of the ocean uh, because it has a private right of action. So uh, um, in my mind, um, privacy advocates uh, in the Democratic caucus should um, be very, you know, cautious of rejecting a deal that has a private right of action because this is, uh, I think, a, a um, significant opportunity to really tighten up on privacy protection. Great. No, that's really insightful. 
um, we're actually coming out with a blog around, uh, you know, to celebrate National Data Privacy Day. I know there's been within the privacy community in particular, there's a lot of action happening in January around this, um, this, you know, excitement around this day. Uh, and we're putting out a blog that will describe some of the top reasons why we think federal privacy legislation needs to move forward. Um, a few of those, just to give you guys, uh, you know, just a quick list or a quick um, feel for it. Uh, some of the critical issues right now are national security concerns with TikTok. You mentioned President Biden and sort of the directive around the uh, federal government and the administration, their uh, show of support for data privacy and for having a uniform standard. Um, and then there's also some ripple effects, of course, cross border data flows, the impact, the economic impact that it has um, on, uh, on, you know, just more broadly, uh, inaction would be detrimental to the US economy. And so we make the case in our blog on all of these key issues. We'd love to learn from you, Omer, like what are some of the top reasons in addition to this, or, you know, if you want to kind of dig into some of these, um, why you think, you know, federal privacy legislation matters and why we should, you know, act on it this year and potentially uh, get a deal done this year. Yeah, th thank you for that. Look, I, I, I'm a privacy professional, a privacy lawyer, and have always supported federal privacy legislation. So I'd start with that. But I think this year, after the Dobbs decision, uh, there is, you know, tremendous impetus for um, legislating privacy as a fundamental human right. Uh, in the United States, we see, you know, how critical it is in the context of reproductive health, but more broadly, also. Um, now, it's true that, you know, the U.S. has marched to its own tune on this uh, for many years, but I, I, I think there is something to be said for the fact that all of the um, Western democracies and all you know a lot of countries that aren't western democracies have data protection legislation and the us uh still doesn't so you, you know it must mean something and i think um uh I, I i do think that it's time now true we do have many federal privacy laws hipaa glba yeah. um, you know fake copa and others ferpa um, and there's been incredible leadership from the FTC, uh, but there's only so much you can do, you know, with those five or six words in the FTC Act from 1914. And uh, many sectors of the economy in the United States remain unregulated from a data perspective. And, um, you know, I think there are significant data excesses uh that manifest in trading of highly sensitive information about um health and race and ethnicity and um i think it's time to regulate them uh, california of course was concerned that a preemptive statute would put aside the achievements that have you know been reached there um and you know it's a fair point but i also think that first of all adppa you know which appeared to be kind of the the draft that gained the most energy uh actually provided stronger protections even for california residents than california law not to mention the fact that it would also apply in 49 other states and, you know, three or four of them now do have state privacy laws, but most of them uh, don't. And finally, I, I, I think, you know, from a corporate perspective, uh, companies need to comply with these laws. And should I say the magic word patchwork, you know, <laughs> we've been talking about it. For a long time, the patchwork gets more and more complicated, different, difficult to navigate. Uh, uh, so there's something to be said for um, a uniform approach. Uh, so for all those reasons, I have and still today support federal privacy legislation. That's great. I think that just goes to show there's, you know, something for everyone, whether it's a social, economic, um, political argument to be made, the list goes on. So that's that's really helpful to, to hear that. Um, 
Nice. I think there's a nice segue from that question to uh, more recent uh, developments this week. So the European Data Protection Board uh, included the draft adequacy decision, which is between the EU and the US on their data privacy framework, in their agenda for the plenary session this week. So I'd love to hear. Um, we tried to tune in. I don't think there was a, a public format for that session, uh, but I would love to hear if you have any insights from folks on the ground um, in the EU on um, you know what happened, if there are going to be uh, pretty quick next steps or any deliberation that's happening behind the scenes that could you know put a any obstacles in um in the path for this adequacy decision and also would love to hear more about kind of your expectations around um the possibility of trends three i know we're we're there's it's probably likely but just want to get a sense from you on all of that um yeah well, I'd say yes to all of the above. Um, yeah. Yes to an adequacy decision. Yes to Schrems 3. We, of course, don't know how that might um, resolve. Um, I don't have any inside information about the deliberations of the EDPB, but I think, you know, there, uh, uh, there is a lot of momentum towards an adequacy decision uh with uh president biden's executive order and the doj regulations and the draft adequacy decision from the european commission so i do think it will happen i i also think i mean we kind of know that it will be Challenge. uh challenged again yeah. in the court of justice of the eu and we don't know what the result will be I think, you know, the European Commission doesn't like losing in its uh, home court and, and its Supreme Court. So they obviously think that um, the framework is robust enough to withstand uh, legal scrutiny. But, you know, they've uh, thought that twice in the past and it didn't work out. Yeah. Um, I think from a practical perspective, a lot of companies have stopped relying on um, adequacy privacy shield or data privacy framework um, as the uh, solution to the uh, uh, cross-border data uh, transfer conundrum and really have resigned to implementing standard clauses plus additional measures um, one thing that we as lawyers have been dealing with a lot over the past uh, couple of years are the transfer impact assessments. Yeah. And I, I think um, that for transfers to the United States, uh, uh, even the current situation is very helpful because I think um, you can point to the um, legal changes here in the United States and to the European Commission's assessment of the same changes as proof that um, the US meets the sufficient safeguards uh, standard already, even before yeah. the uh, you know, oh, the dotting of the I's and the crossing of the T's on the adequacy decision. So I think the progress has been helpful and probably significant, at least for the many companies, the majority of companies, really, that are relying on standard clauses together with the transfer impact assessment. Great. Really helpful. Um, last question for you. I think we've dug into federal. We talked about the global implications and cross-border data flows. Um, we want to dig in. I know you saw your 2022 predictions, and I uh, teed it up with you know how we actually fared in the U.S. and it seemed like you were spot on. So I want to see kind of have you look into your crystal ball again. You also did a piece out of IEPP News uh, that talks about the big trends that you're envisioning. Would love to see you know kind of at the state level, more granular on the ground. Uh, there's a number of states that are going to be introducing um, you know legislation, and then also of course regulations are building on enacted uh, laws, including California. California, Colorado, um, and deep in the weeds on those. I would love to hear from you on where you think the biggest trends are. Also, automated decision making is another hot topic right now uh, in California, New York, and a couple of other states. So, um, if you could shed light on what you think the top trends in the state on the state side would be um, within the U.S., would love to hear from you. Yeah. So, uh, as you say, I do think that this is the year of state privacy law in in the U.S. So, you know, there is the spy in the sky of the federal privacy legislation. But short of that, 
we have a bunch of state laws coming into force um, this year. Of course, the CPRA amendments to CCPA in California have already come into force a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Virginia's law is now in effect. Uh, Colorado and Connecticut um, in July and Utah in December. And just the start of the legislative period and the uh, state assemblies has, you know, provided us with a dozen or more yeah. um, state uh, privacy draft bills. Um, in terms of, you know, the biggest player in California, there are very significant changes this year. So first of all, a new privacy regulator. So the California Privacy Protection Agency is really the first um, committed data protection agency in the United States because the FTC, of course, has, you know, other consumer protection issues as well as antitrust. Uh, it's also led by a very ad tech savvy um, uh, professional, Ashwan Sultani, who's very experienced in this space on both the technology and policy side. Uh, so we expect to see great things out of um, them. They're working, of course, now on the California regulations, which everybody is, um, you know, following. Uh, the expansion of CCPA to employees and yeah. business contacts is also a major development. Yeah. It's the first time we see a state privacy law in the U.S. that applies to employees um, and companies need to uh, prepare for and adjust and comply Um so um, so that's, you know, a major development. On the consumer side, I think the main changes that we are focusing on are the notice app collection, which is um, much stricter now and is a new feature of uh, CPRA. And of course, the whole universe of opting out of cross-context behavioral advertising Hugely impactful set of provisions in CPRA, um, greatly expanded compared to the uh, yeah. uh, opt out of sale under CCPA. Um, the fact that a company can't serve as a service provider for the purposes of cross context behavioral advertising is very significant because under a CCPA and do not sell, a lot of companies kind of check that box. Yeah by saying, well, we are a service provider or our partners are a service provider. But now for CCBA, there's no service provider option. Uh, so that exerts um, a lot of uh, pressure. Um, there's Actually, also on advertising. Let, one quick question there. Do you think, yep. do you see some sort of substitute model that will come into effect? I think hearing a lot about privacy enhancing technologies and how that will be used as a uh, potential um, substitute for the uh, current cross contextual advertising model that's happening in California. Do you think that's going to be a potential solution? Are there others that companies are considering just given that this would be a huge change to their underlying um, you know, plan uh, to, to pr provide personalized advertising? Yeah, I mean, the industry has faced significant headwinds for, you know, quite a few years now with the e-privacy directive in Europe and then GDPR, the cookie banner, you know, uh, situation. And then here in the U.S. with uh, CCPA, other state laws, and maybe even primarily the, the platforms, uh, uh, changes, you know, Apple's uh, uh, app tracking transparency, uh, which is already in effect, and um, Google's privacy sandbox, and it's, yes. um, you know, basically a promise to deprecate third-party cookies um, in a couple of years now. Um mm -hmm. So, so with all that, I think industry is trying to find the right approach and privacy enhancing technologies, clean room sandboxes, 
mm -hmm. are part of the solution. There are also contractual aspects to this. Uh, the IAB uh, published its MSPA, which is a framework contract and allows different parties to um, interface and connect uh, based on certain policy determinations with respect to if someone's a service provider or engaging in CCBA and in opt-out mode or not opt-out mode. And, you know, it's the MSPA slices it very thin with respect to each state law and also provides a potential national approach. Um, so, so yes, it's a major thing the industry is dealing with, obviously. Um, I'll also remind that uh, uh, the CPRA now added the limit uh, use of my sensitive data yeah. uh, provision. So it's still an opt-out, but for sensitive data and some of the other state laws actually require an opt-in for sensitive data. So that's also a significant change, especially for third parties and the data broker industry, uh, given that they don't have the consumer interface to ask people to opt in. And, you know, their um, kind of business model may be in a precarious uh, situation now. Uh, another important development in California is the Age Appropriate Design Code yeah. Act, which passed last um, August. And, you know, there's great focus both on the federal front and in the states and also internationally um, on kids and teens privacy. And I guess the, the main uh, changes that the Age Appropriate Design Code the Act um, introduces to the existing regime, which is the federal COPPA regime, mm -hmm. is that it applies not just to kids under 13, but to teenagers under 18, so mm -hmm. any minor. Uh, plus, it doesn't only um, cover uh, websites or online services that are directed at children under 13, uh, or general audience sites with um, where the um, uh, uh, company has actual knowledge that kids are using it, but it now applies to sites or services that are likely to be accessed by, uh, um, by kids and teens under 18. Um, that's a major shift. Because it's one thing to be directed at children, it's a completely different thing to likely be accessed by uh, minors and, you know, even porn sites or gambling, gaming, which might not at all be uh, directed at kids, uh, um, you know, still are very likely to be accessed by a fair amount of um, uh, yeah. minors, yeah, who yeah. are under 18 years old. Yeah. Uh, so they will have to comply with the age appropriate design code. And this includes, for example, uh, deploying age estimation. So collecting more data to yeah. um, uh, uh, understand uh, the characteristics of their users, sometimes biometric data, because facial um, scanning can be used to yeah. um, to uh, uh, estimate age. Um, so I think you know that's um, a major expansion of the um, legal regime we've seen around kids' data. Awesome. Well, that was really comprehensive. Um, appreciate having you here today with us. Uh, I'm sure this was just a a small, you know, a tip of the iceberg into what we're expecting for 2023. Um, and uh, we are really, ex you know, excited that you've been able to help us prepare for um, the momentum for the year ahead. So uh, thanks again for your time today um, and appreciate having you uh, here with us. Thanks for having me. That's always a pleasure. Great. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.